So with uh, this talk and most of the talks that I give at these salons, I like to go back to the like basic ideas in machine learning and deep learning and sort of you know give them a second thought, maybe think about them a slightly different way and uh, talk about them with different in a different style. So in particular, this time, I am going to uh, talk about the, uh, the neural network loss and how it can be thought of as a unit test. So the view that I think makes the most sense for thinking about machine learning is that machine learning is automated programming. So when we program, what do we do? We produce computer programs that have some desired behavior. It doesn't really help if we just produce any old computer program. And so when humans program, when humans do it, they write code. So we reason about the desired behavior, and then we encode text files with that reasoning. When machine learning algorithms optimize models, when we automate programming with machine learning, the, they observe desired behavior, and then they encode parameter values to match that behavior. This is a very different process. They have the same end result, which is a computer program, whether it's you know, resnet.py or hello world.py, but the process by which they come about is quite different. Uh, but let's focus on the similarities first, which is we need in both cases to ensure that our programs have that desired behavior. So for machine learning, we use loss functions and optimization algorithms. Uh, the optimizer will write some parameters that make the loss go down. Uh, and that is the way that we try and ensure that our machine learned algorithm is behaving correctly. For human programming, we don't use loss functions. At least I don't when I'm uh, writing Python code. We use tests of desired behavior. So humans it, are going to be writing text files that make the tests pass. Right? Our goal is that the code that we write passes all of the tests in our testing suite. And what I think is interesting about looking at it this way is that both of these approaches are flawed. They have failure modes. The loss, making the loss go down on the training set doesn't always give us a good algorithm. Passing our tests does not always give us good code. And I think it's revealing that they actually end up sharing some of the same flaws. And some flaws are better known in in programming, in traditional human programming, and some are better known in machine learning. So the ethos that tests should drive development is, the, is encapsulated in the principle of test-driven development, which is a workflow that says, first, I decide on the behavior of a new feature for my code. Then I write tests that will only pass if that feature behaves correctly. Then I write code that passes those tests. And then I repeat this over and over again. I come up with a new feature, I write more tests, then I write more code in that order. So what does it look like to think of machine learning in that way? Well, in, in that case, we're actually gonna be using loss-driven development instead of test-driven development. First, we decide on the behavior for a new data point, And that usually means loading the desired target. So especially in supervised learning. Then we'll write code that tests how close we are to the right behavior. And that's exactly what our loss function is when we think of our loss as a function of the parameters. It tells us how close did we get to doing the right thing. Then uh, we update the model so that we do better on that test, right? So we use something like gradient descent or Atom or whatever optimizer it is that we're using to update the model to improve our performance on the test. And then we do that over and over again. We come up with a new behavior that we want from a new data point and then, or a batch of data points. And then we use the loss and the optimizer once again to improve, the, uh, improve our behavior on that, that new test. So this connection here is clear for an idea that's maybe taken a while for machine learning to really uh, internalize, which is the idea of out of distribution data. So the most common failure mode for test-driven development is that the testing suite that we have is just not broad enough to cover what's encountered in real life when we get into production. We tested a whole bunch of things, but we didn't test what happened when somebody uses a name that's entirely composed of emojis. So our tests weren't, weren't they didn't cover everything. Similarly, machine learning models can fail when the, test, when the training set is not broad enough to cover what is encountered once they're in production. We don't have pictures of blue stop signs in our self-driving car data set, but maybe they're out there somewhere in the world. 
So this is the problem of generalization to out of distribution data, and it's as unsolved for machine learning as it is for test driven development. But I'd be interested to see if there are any ideas from test driven development that could help us rethink how we might handle this out of distribution data problem. Another one problem that's actually maybe easier to understand in machine learning and maybe less common in test driven development is the problem of overfitting. So when I first proposed this idea about what the uh, about the the loss being a unit test, somebody said, "Well, I don't see how overfitting fits into this idea," and that's a really important thing for people to understand. So I thought about it for a while, uh, and I came up with this example. It's important that we remember when we think about how this process would work that computers are actually just dumb rocks that we tricked into thinking, and they follow the letter of what we ask, not the spirit. So we might think of them as being like golems, which are a famous uh, machine from Eastern European Jewish folklore uh, about uh, these machines that are you know, essentially a danger to their creators as much as they are a, a, a powerful machine. And this idea that computers are sort of uh, dumb and pedantic also includes when we ask them to pass tests by writing programs. So if we are, uh, if we're, you know, when we ask a human to write code that passed tests, they look at the tests and they try to come up with an, a good faith effort to write a good program that passes those tests. They look at the name of what we want, you know, print hello world or divide by two, and they try and come up with a, a good program. Uh, but computers aren't going to do that. So to extend this idea, this analogy so that it covers overfitting, I imagined what might happen if programmers were being incentivized the same way our machine learning algorithms were. So imagine what might happen if programmer salaries were tied to test passing and nothing else. It doesn't matter if the website goes down, doesn't matter if all the users on the Google Play Store give us zero stars. If we pass the tests, we get paid, right? And also those tests were, uh, were written by somebody else and they're gonna execute the, the tests themselves, but they're never gonna read our code, right? They're just gonna look, okay, did you pass the tests or not? And I think if you think about it that way, it's clear that test-driven development is not going to be enough. Uh, and to exemplify just how badly this can go wrong, I came up with this extremely cursed and unpleasant Python uh, example, which is, so when we write our tests, we usually say something like, okay, there's this function foo that's in my implementation file. And in my test, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give foo some argument, and then I'm going to expect that it gives a particular output. And passing the test means that the output of foo is the expected output. This is a very common style of test. So I imagine what I might write if my salary depended on passing this test and nothing else. Uh, and I came up with uh, this guy, this implementation of foo, which I checked in PyTest does indeed pass the test on the left without doing anything sensible whatsoever. Uh, so I used a few pieces of Python dark magic. So I looked at the traceback. I did some importing of modules and finding, uh, getting a hold of the test foo function and then reading its source code. And inside that source code, I looked for an assert line, right? Because the tests that are going to be run are probably going to be assert statements. And then in that assert statement, I pull out what I'm supposed to put, uh, what I'm supposed to return. And then I just return that. Uh, so, you know, whatever the test says they want, return it. But this is clearly, you know, not what any reasonable person would want code to do. Uh, so this is an example of overfitting to the tests. I have written code that passes the test, but it does nothing else. And this is exactly what our machine learning models do when they overfit to our training data. They become good at giving the desired behavior on the training data, but terrible at everything else. So what would the solution be? You know, besides coming up with a better workflow than, you know, shackling your programmers to passing tests. So if there are some tests that these programmers cannot see, but on which they'll be evaluated, then they have no choice but to examine the tests and try and actually implement the right program, a program with the behavior we actually desire. Even, no, you know, no matter how nefarious they are or how lazy, like this is the only option that they have. Similarly, if there are data examples that the model cannot see, but on which it is being evaluated, then the best performing algorithm will be the one that examines the pattern of the examples and selects parameters that result in the desired behavior. And this is exactly what we do when we do a valid, like when we hold out a validation set, right? When we do cross-validation, 
we say, here are some points you've never seen before. How are you doing on this? For programming, that would mean take some tests and apply them to the code and see, OK, do you pass these tests that you've never gotten a chance to see? And this also, I think, brings some interesting insight into a phenomenon called catastrophic forgetting. So it's been known for a really long time, back since neural networks were thought of as connectionist psychology, so you know, way back in the 80s, that they're subject to a phenomenon called catastrophic forgetting, which is that if you take a network that's been trained to, say, solve ImageNet, and then train it on a task that's, say, take ImageNet images and tell me whether they're red or green, uh, then the performance on the first task will actually plummet over time. And it's, this will even happen if the tests, if these two tasks are very close to each other. So this is represented in this figure over here. Uh, what this figure represents is uh, on the y-axis are the performance on three different tasks. So let's focus on this one up here. So first we train the network on task A and it gets good at that task. Then we start training it on task B. It gets good at task B, but it starts getting worse at task C. And then we start training it on a third task, task C and it gets even worse. And over time, it will get back to you know, completely random performance on the original task as it continues to learn these different things. So this is a surprising phenomenon. I think a lot of people aren't necessarily expecting it. Can we get some intuition to it by thinking about the loss as a unit test? So the important thing about unit tests is actually that they're meant to be run before each commit. This is why when we're doing test-driven development, we use continuing, uh, like, Continual integration. We make sure that every time somebody tries to add code to our code base, the tests get run. These prevent code regression, right? Where we lose behavior that we had previously and we wanted in a new update. So this is something that actually Francois Cholet pointed out in a recent tweet. He said that the purpose of unit tests is not really actually checking correctness now. It's to ensure that you don't get code regression, that you don't get future breakages. Uh, so this is, this is the real import of tests. It's you know, probably the primary utility of writing tests is, in, is, is when they are run with each commit. But catastrophic forgetting actually happens when we stop testing, right? We, when a network trained on one task is then trained to perform a new task, the original task loss is not invoked while we're training for the new task. We don't go back and say, oh, by the way, you also still need to be good at task A. And this is equivalent to no longer testing for that old desired behavior. Right, so it's like turning off the tests for your original, for module A, while you're writing code that is in module B and that both of them end up touching. And so it should be no surprise that we get neural network performance regression in the same way that we would get code regression in a traditional software model with test-driven development. So the central analogy here of the loss as a unit test is that in, in, we're still programming when we're doing machine learning. Uh, the optimizer is our programmer, and we are now the managers. Uh, and so instead of using tests to ensure that our, our programmer is doing the right thing, we use loss functions and optimizers. And, uh, but otherwise, there's a lot of connections, a lot of similarities to what happens when humans program uh, and when they use test-driven development. So they share the same flaws and they share the same strengths. So uh, this is an analogy I'm kind of excited about. I'm probably going to be thinking about this a good amount in the future to try and come up with new ways that this might bring new insights into different 